stand-up physicist. This is the second show of six dealing with my talks on unifying gravity and electromagnetism by using analogies to electromagnetism. I gave these talks at MIT during the independent activities period. Now saying MIT might sound impressive, but really no one invited me. <laughs> no professor invited me. No student invited me. I kind of invited myself. But it was a very useful endeavor, even though no professor showed up and no graduate, undergraduate lasted throughout the entire series, because it allowed me to clarify so many issues and come up with so many wonderful little pictures to describe what, I th what my proposal is all about. In the first show, I went over the big picture. My unification proposal is a four-dimensional slinky. So there are, if something's moving along, there are two modes to deal with EM that are transverse and a scalar and longitudinal mode to deal with gravity. That's the big picture. I then went over a long list of things that a unification theory has to accomplish to be acceptable. And hopefully over these series of talks, I'll show that maybe it could do that sort of work. And then finally I introduced tensors, which usually you only get to in graduate school, but <laughs> we're an advanced cable theoretical physics show. So we did it in that first, uh, first one. We introduced a bunch of terms and some pictures so you could get a little bit of a handle on how it kind of worked. In today's show, we're going to deal with units and Lagrange densities. These are at kind of opposite poles of a physics education. When you just start out, then you must get your units right, or the teacher will say you are wrong because you are wrong. <laughs> but when you get all the way into graduate school, what they do is they say, well, We'll use these natural units. And the great things about natural units is we don't have to write them out. They'll all work out. It'll be wonderful. It'll be beautiful. It's only if you have to get close to actual data that you have to work all this stuff out. Now that system works, but we're going to show respect for our origins. And so for every expression I ever present in any of these shows at any time, you can work out the units and they'd better be right. The, sec the other pole of, of physics education is once you get into graduate school, you learn about these things called Lagrange densities. These are very difficult, so they don't allow undergraduates, let alone people in high school, even hear about them. But in this advanced theoretical physics show, we will do them. Because if you have enough pictures and enough little ideas, they actually aren't that hard. And the first sli slide, please, is devoted to units. So we'll go over the basic units. That's what all other units are built from. We'll learn how to uh, tr change units by using conversion factors. We'll go over the units for space-time the units for electric charges and fields, and then we'll see the units in action. We'll see them in that Lagrange density, in fields, in momentum, and in force. So what are the basic units? They would be time, length, and mass. Oh, <laughs> that was kind of loud. <laughs> Every other sort of unit in physics can be built from those three. That might seem a little odd if you know something about charge, which is normally measured in units of coulombs. Because a coulomb doesn't sound like a meter or uh, a second or a kilogram. But you use Coulomb's law to figure out how to express it in such terms because Coulomb's law is one charge times another charge over R squared. So force is ma 
mass times acceleration or mass times length over time squared. So if you work it all out, the units for electric charge are the square root of m times l to the three halves all over time. <laughs> and I'm serious, that's what they are. I don't quite understand why they're so weird. But if you want to get your units right, you always have to think of electric charge in terms of square root of m over l to the three halves over t. <laughs> it's kind of fun. What are conversion factors? Conver conversion factors are ways to change from one fundamental unit to another fundamental unit. So there are three really important conversion factors. One for gravity, one for special relativity, and the other for quantum mechanics. So the uh, constant g, Newton's gravitational constant, is a calling card for gravity. If you see an expression that has, uh, has g in it, it is about gravity. Newton's law of gravity got a g right in there. The speed of light c is a calling card for special relativity. Things for like going fast. It's all about going fast. So for example, um, figuring out the interval between two events in space-time that will have c's in it, that's about special relativity. Now if you see a g and a c together, then that is about relativistic gravity. New, uh, Einstein's expressions for gravity are like that. I will present expressions like that in my own theory. And then the Planck's constant h is a calling card for quantum mechanics. So if you see a c and an h together, that's about relativistic quantum mechanics. If you see a g, a c, and an h together, that's relativistic quantum mechanical gravity. So the great advantage of always keeping your units together is that you'll get a sense of what physics you're really dealing with. So let's look at the units of space-time. Things like volume, length, width, depth, those all have uh, units of L, so that's L cubed. The interval between two events is going to be a unit of time, but it's got both distance and time, and you have to use a C to get things right. The stretch factor gamma of special relativity has no units. Neither does the relativistic velocity, no units. So you have to do the balance between what you measure and these constants so that it has no units. And then if you want to look at a four velocity, well, it does have units. And so you kind of take that dimensionless thing and multiply it by C and boom, you've got it. Now we look at the units of charges, fields, and potentials. Now these are all kind of related to each other. So they all have this, and you can kind of tell by the units because that odd square root of M thing shows up in all of them. So the potential is kind of the starting point, the simplest thing. And that is the square root of m over the square root of l. Uh, yeah, over the square root of l. You take the derivative of that and you end up with a field. And the fields for electromagnetism have the units of square root of m time times uh, over the square root of l. Now there is that electric charge, which we kind of worked through before, the cause of all these odd square root of m's. And there is the charge in motion, uh, current. And that's going to be the charge per unit volume. And then it's going to be moving at a velocity. So you have to throw in a few more things. Now the most interesting thing to notice about these is different ways you can arrive at these combinations of units using G's, C's, and H's, and Q's, electric charge. So, for example, for electric charge, hey, it's got the right units. It started with the right ones, it stayed there. You can get to the same units by using the square root of G times M. So I am going to rely on that. That I am going to swap a square root of GM 
for Q because I can. They have exactly the same units. And then there is also an observation about that the square root of CH has the same units as electric charge. I actually don't know quite what that means at this point, <laughs> but I always file it away because that's relativistic quantum mechanics. And so it's very suggestive units-wise. Maybe I can swap that in at some fun time and do some interesting physics. Now we're going to put our units in action. And we start where all physicists should start with the Lagrange density. I'm going to talk about that more in a little moment, but it's everything that can happen inside a box. Like most people studying physics, I found this initially very difficult to understand. <laughs> what were these people doing? And they were doing it with such seriousness, too. This was the tough stuff. This was the serious stuff. And wh why did it work? Figuring out the units was a huge, huge insight for me. Because the units are mass over length cubed. So mass, well, that's the same as energy if you throw in the c squared at the right, right place. And so it's all the kind of energy interactions that can happen inside a box. And that's it. That's what you're studying when you're studying a Lagrange density. And then you take derivatives of this thing and it, it, it tells you different information about all the interactions that can happen inside a box. And once again, we can get to the units of mass per unit volume using a, a electric charges, Q. We can use it using the square root of GM. We can use it with different combinations of H and C. Now we go on to what are called field equations. And we get to field equations by using the Euler-Lagrange equation. What that is, is we take the Lagrange density and we take a derivative of that with respect to the potential. And that's what gets us the field equations. I considered this a small, no, this is actually a major miracle as far as physics is concerned, that you can take the derivative of the EM Lagrange density and generate the Maxwell equations for light. I was taught that the Maxwell equations were simply created by Maxwell to make everything kind of look pretty, because that's what happened historically. But if you had the EM Lagrange density, all you have to do is take the certain derivative, spend, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour cranking away at the math, and you get the Maxwell equations every time. So it wasn't an inspired guess. Oh, well, it was. But it could also be viewed as just part of the machinery of physics. Let's move on to, um, move on to momentum. How do you get this? Same way you got the field equations. You start with the Lagrange density. You now take a different kind of derivative, but you end up with the momentum. And what's really neat is if you work out the units, you've got a G, an H, a C. And that's the calling card of a relativistic quantum mechanic expression. I haven't really done anything with it <laughs> at this point, but I know because I keep my units straight that if I want to work on relativistic quantum gravity, I should start playing with that particular expression. You can also get to the relativistic force from the, from the Lagrange density. What you do this time is take the uh, least action by varying uh, velocity, the four velocity, and you can end up at the force equations. And here again, you can use different combinations of g, square root of uh, square root of g m, q, and get and get at mass times length over time squared. Let's talk about Lagrange densities. Now, this is supposed to be a really, really difficult concept that you're not supposed to get to, into until you're in graduate school, but we're going to do it because we are the best theoretical physics show on cable.
we are going to show you uh, what the EM Lagrange density is, the Lagrange density for light. I will then show you how I want to change this so that it might be able to handle gravity. And then we will go on to my gravity Lagrange density hypothesis and show how it very naturally merges to form the GEM Lagrange hi hypothesis, the unified field theory. And then I want to finish with looking into Lagrange densities to see the symmetry inside. Because if you can see the symmetry in inside, you really understand why these things are so important. So first we start with the most successful Lagrange density in all of physics, the EM Lagrange density. It's got three parts that are used to describe all the interactions that happen with electric fields with, by, but ignoring gravity. So you've got a mass in motion kind of term, which is a rank zero sort of thing. Then you have this contraction of two rank one tensors, one for the, the charge in motion and the other for the four potential. And then you have a contraction of the anti-symmetric field strength tensor. Now because it's anti-symmetric, no change in the symmetric me metric tensor can be involved in it. And that will be very important shortly. All three of these have the same minus sign in front. And because of that, if we do uh, the variation required to get a force equation by using the first two terms, we'll end up a force, with a force equation where like charges repel, which is how ele uh, electric currents work. If we do a variation on the second two and third terms by varying the, uh, the potential, then we will end up with, with field equations, and with those field equations, like charges again repel from each other which is, of course, the way electromagnetism actually works. So now, what am I going to change? What am I going, how am I going to use EM to establish uh, an analogy to gravity? Well, I'm not going to change anything about a particle moving around. Particles move around in gravity, they move around in EM. But I'm going to change the type of charge. I'm going to change from Q, minus Q, to a plus square root of g m. That has the same units. That's why units were so important earlier. <laughs> it's a fair thing to swap out. And finally, I'm going to go from an anti-symmetric ten tensor to a symmetric tensor. Why is that? Well, I'm doing that for two reasons, actually. With the anti-symmetric tensor, if I change the order, I flip signs. So there's a kind of sign flipping quality to electric charge. And we know there are two electric charges. With a symmetric tensor, I change those, the order of those, the sign say, stays the same. So that has an important quality of gravity, which is there's only one charge. And another important aspect is that by going with a symmetric tensor, I must incorporate the fact that the, the metric could change and how that metric changes makes a contribution to my field strength tensor. And at least to my ear, that starts to sound a little bit like what gravity actually does. So that's the analogy that I'm using. And I use it to form the gravity Lagrange density hypothesis. And so there is my Lagrange density, and it's trying to characterize all the types of interactions that can happen involving gravity inside a box without having any EM whatsoever around. And so it's got the same mass and motion sort of term. It's got two rank one tensors contracting. It's got a mass charge current with the potential and it's got a symmetric tensor. But notice the changes in sign. Those are really important that this, the one in the middle 
actually is the one that changes sign. Because if I do a variation on velocity to get the force equation, I'm going to have an expression where like charges attract, which is what they do in gravity. Whereas if I do the variation with respect to the potential, which involves the second and the third term, I'm going to end up with field equations where like pot charges attract, which is the way gravity works. So that has a lot of good, good things about it. Okay, um, so now how do I form the unified field theory, the gem Lagrange uh, density hypothesis? Well, it's really just the union of these two. We've got the same particle moving around term, that rank zero term. We have two different types of charges with two different signs with exactly the same units contracting with the same potential. And we have uh, the, the field strength tensor. Now, if you remember from that tensor discussion, I said that any asymmetric tensor is the sum of a symmetric tensor with its antisymmetric tensor. So basically, all we are doing is is doing a contraction of the asymmetric tensor. And so that, is, I wrote that in a big box because it's really that important to my proposal. We will be taking different derivatives of that thing and they will lead to field equations, to force equations, to energy momentum. But it's fixed. I'm not going to change it. It's what my entire theory is about in one line. And everything else is just a consequence of that expression. And that's kind of how rigid the logic of physics sometimes is. But what I want to now help you with is seeing symmetry within these Lagrange densities. Because if you can see the symmetry, then you can understand what things are conserved. Because it's this wonderful property of Lagrange densities that if you can change something and really nothing changes about how, the, how that thing gets calculated, you have found a symmetry of your theory. And that means you found something that is actually conserved. You come back, because think of it this way, you come back after changing that thing, nothing's changed, it's conserved. So, the Lagrange density has J's current densities, A's potentials, derivatives of potentials. But it doesn't have like a time, a T in there. Because it doesn't have a time in there, that means that this Lagrange density is, will conserve energy. Because it doesn't have an X in there or a Y, or a z, it means momentum is conserved in the x, the y, and the z directions. Because there is kind of a rotational symmetry in, involved in this, angular momentum is also conserved. What is a little more subtle initially is noticing that with EM down that diagonal there were no values. The reason there was no values is in that subtraction process that we used. We actually remove anything that you put there. So no matter what you put where to put there, we'd throw it away. <laughs> and that's a form of symmetry in the Lagrange density. And for that reason, it, we say it has U1 symmetry. But the result is that electric charge is conserved. It's all because of that symmetry down the diagonal. With my proposal, what we have is we have this extra tensor having to do with how the metric changes. So um, there's a symmetry here because we don't know whether stuff is in uh, the, the way the potential changes or whether it's because of the way uh, the metric changes. And that's what's called a diffeomorphism. And that diffeomorphism is what 
mass charge conservation is about. It's about mass charge because if we have a conservation involving how the metric changes, that's what inertia is all about. So I hope what we've done in this lecture is that we have gone over units and we're showing units the kind of respect they still deserve after all these years because they do have a reward. We will see wh what sort of field a an equation uh, applies to simply by whether it's got a G, an H, or a C, or some combination of those three. And we have also gone uh, over the Gem Lagrange hypothesis. Everything I say subsequent to this flows from that. So thank you very much. Now what the hell was all that? I'll tell you what it was. That was doggy crap. Now I know doggy crap because I've been stepping in it my entire life. I can teach you some good things, good things to know, like a duck call. <coughs> Look at that. Got me a duck. <laughs> Pretty good. Now them intellectuals. They won't teach you no practical things like this. So to heck with them. <laughs>